Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome on behalf of the Center for European, Russian and uh, Euro-Asian Studies. Um, um, welcome to our webinar. Um, my name is Piotr Vrubel. I'm going to introduce the speaker. I'm a professor of history at the history department and also a member of uh, CERES. Um, this session has been prepared by uh, Dr. Olga Kesarchuk uh, from the Center or particularly Petroyatsik Program for the Study of Ukraine and by Larissa Yarovenko uh, from our Center as well. Uh, so they are responsible for all the technicalities. Um, uh, our Center is located, as you know, at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. And uh, um, uh, today's title uh, topic is Nikolai Birdyaev and Dmitry Donsov on the origins and development of Russian messianism and anti-Westernism. And let me introduce the speaker now, because it's very important that you know who's talking to you. So our speaker is Professor Alexander Zaitsev from uh, the Catholic University of uh, Lviv. Uh, Professor Zaitsev um, has been teaching there for the last, well, approximately 20 years. Uh, he also served on several important uh, administration positions at this university and at the history uh, department. Um, uh, Professor Zaitsev um, graduated from Ivan Franco State University of Lviv uh, in 1986. Then he worked at a certain polytechnical um, um, university and then he joined the Catholic University of uh, um, Lviv. In 2014, he defended his doctoral thesis on Ukrainian national, in, integral nationalism of the 1920s and the 1930s, Genesis Evolution Comparative Analysis. Um, um, Professor Zaitsev um, is a very prolific writer. He authored several books related to today's topic, uh, like in 2011, Nationalism and Religion. I'm reading English translation of the titles. Nationalism and Religion, the Greek Catholic Church and Ukrainian Nationalist Movement in Galicia. Um, uh, then um, in uh, 2013, Ukrainian Integral Nationalism of the 1920s and the 30s. And then in um, 2022, um, uh, another, another, another book. Or in between in 2019, um, a nationalism in the fascist epoch, Dmitry Donsov's life period. So uh, also um, there is a long list of articles published by Professor, Professor Zaitsev, and uh, he is uh, a frequent visitor to international centers, uh, including Harvard, including um, some other uh, prestigious um, uh, places. So again, um, today's um, topic is Nikolai Birdyaev and Dmitry Donsov on the origins and development of Russian messianism and anti-Westernism. Professor Zaitsev, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you, Professor, for this introduction and thank you for the opportunity to speak at this webinar. Our webinar today is taking place during the war that Russia is waging in my country. And I will not hide that I choose the topic of my talk to link my research project, the intellectual biography of Metro Donso, with current events. Because what Donso and Berdyaev wrote about Russia in the first half of the 20th century is directly related to what is happening today. Why did the current war begin? Many people respond because Putin decided to attack Ukraine. From this they conclude that if Putin is removed, everything will be fine. Even President Biden recently said that this man cannot remain in power. 
I strongly support these words, but unfortunately, even if Putin is removed, it will be only a temporary and an incomplete solution to the problem because the roots of the conflict are much deeper. Today, many Russians believe that Russia is waging war not against Ukraine, but against the West, which threatens Russia by using Ukraine. What's more, in their imagination, Russia is a playing a messianic role, liberating not only Ukraine from the Nazis and foreign rule, but also the whole world from Western, especially American domination. And this combination of messianism with anti-Westernism has long roots. Over the past 200 years, many thinkers and scholars have tried to explain Russia's attitude to the West and in particular, the phenomenon of Russian messianism. Among them were Nikolai Berdyayev and Metro Donsov. It is difficult to imagine more different thinkers. The first was a Russian philosopher who developed the ideas of Christian existentialism and personalism. The second was the main ideologue of Ukrainian integral nationalism. Nevertheless, some parallels can be found in their views of Russian messianism and Russian communism. My main, main argument consists of four theses. First, as early as the beginning of the 1920s, Donso used the concept of Russian messianism as the key to understanding Russian history, including the history of Russian communism. Second, in the 1930s, Berdyayev developed this theory in detail, and in his version, it became the most influential. Third, Don so much more than Berdyayev associated Russian messianism with anti-Westernism and imperialism, and fourth. Until now, Don Sov's explanatory scheme performed a prognostic function much better than Berdyayev's, but it doesn't mean that Donsov was right in everything. It is believed that Berdyayev was the first to formulate the theory of Russian messianism as a phenomenon that permeates the entire history of Russia. For example, Anna Siliak, professor at Queen's University, wrote in a very interesting article, Nikolai Berdyayev and the origin of Russian Messianism. I quote, Russian Messianism has a distinct genealogy, one that can be easily traced back to the post-1917 writings of the Russian emigre philosopher Nikolai Berdyayev. Berdyayev, borrowing from a Silver Age philosophical context, formulated the idea of Russian Messianism in the precise terms in which we understand it today particularly in his two most influential works, The Origin of Russian Communism and The Russian Idea. Through these works, Berdyayev propagated the idea of Russian messianism as one crucial for understanding Russia's, Russia's historical path. He contended that Russians firmly believed in their country as the third Rome, a country fundamentally Eastern, but able to synthesize the best civilizational elements of East and West, and thus a country perfectly poised to create a universal Christian kingdom. For Berdyayev, this Russian belief in a Russian mission was the only way to understand Russian intellectual life, Russian revolutionary and cultural and cultural movements, and ultimately Russian communism. And of and I think this is a fairly accurate description of Berdyayev's ideas, but was he the first to formulate them? Almost all these ideas, including the famous metaphor of the third international instead of the third Rome, can be found in Matrodon Sov's book, The Foundations of Our Policy, published in 1921, 16 years before Berdyayev's book, The Origin of Russian Communism, was first published. Here we can find almost all of Berdyayev's key ideas about Russian messianism 
with one important exception. Donsov never wrote that Russians firmly, firmly believed that Russia was able to synthesize the best civilizational elements of East and West. Instead, much more than Berdyayev, he emphasized Russia's fundamental hostility to the West. Before comparing Berdyayev's and Donsov's concepts, I'd like to say a few words about their intellectual biographies before the beginning of 1920s. Of course, it is difficult to compare Donsov with Berdyayev, the thinker Berdyayev is much deeper than Donsov. However, certain parallels can be traced in both their biographies and their concepts. Both Berdyayev and Donso were born in Ukraine. Berdyayev in Obuchiv near Kiev, and Donso in Melitopol, the town which is now occupied by Russian troops, by the way. In their use, both were Marxists. However, Berdyayev, who was nine years older than Donso, was one of the so-called critical Marxists who tried to synthesize certain aspects of Marx teaching with non-Marxist philosophical theories. Ukrainian social democrat Donso belonged to those Marxists who, according to the same Berdyayev, I quote, uh, valued above all the integral totalitarian world outlook, defended their orthodoxy and were distinguished by extreme intolerance. The future ideologue of integral nationalism was in his young years an orthodox, integral Marxist, an active fighter against bourgeois ideology, Ukrainian nationalism, and religion. When Donso came to Marxism in 1905, Berdyayev had already departed from it. A few years later, he came up with the idea of Russian message. In 1911, Berdyayev published an essay, uh, The Problem of East and West in the Religious Consciousness of Vladimir Solovyov, in which he wrote, Russia, uh, Russia is the uh, third, third Rome. This proud consciousness ran through almost all Russian history. And let me remind that uh, Third Rome is a theological and political concept asserting this, that Moscow is the successor of Roman Empire. According to it, the first Rome was the ancient Rome itself, the capital of the Roman Empire. The second Rome was, a, was Constantinople, the capital of Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire. And the third Rome is Moscow or entire Russia. The idea was first formulated by the, by the Mont Philophe in the early 16th century, addressing the Grand Prince of Moscow, Vasily III. He wrote, two Romes have fallen, but the third, that is Moscow, stands, and there will be no fourth. Uh, historians have debated what Philophe actually mean, meant, how well known his concept was in the 16th and uh, 17th centuries, and whether it had any influence on politics. But another theme is important for us. When in the second half of the 19th century, historians rediscovered the letters of Philophe, the concept of the Third Rome was adopted by ideologues of Russian messiahs. For some of them, the Third Rome was a symbol of uh, Russia's spiritual supremacy over the West, and for others, a hope for the future synthesis of East and West, and Berdyayev belonged to the latter. He asked, what will Russia contribute to the tragedy of world history? What truth will it tell the world? And answer, I quote, Russia has a world mission only in that case, if it brings its truth to the world, the truth unknown to the West and preserved only in the East. If Russia cannot live and fulfill its task without the truth of the West, then the West cannot manage without the truth of Russia, the truth of Eastern Orthodoxy. The very formulation of the problem of East and West presupposes the mutual 
replenishment of two experiences and two paths. Russia bears a shrine, bears a shrine without which the goals of world history will not be realized and its religious meaning will not be fulfilled. During the First World War, Bonsol also moved away from Marxism, but in a completely different direction than Berdyaev. He turned to voluntarism in philosophy and Ukrainian nationalism in politics. In 1917, both thinkers turned to the analysis of Bolshevism. Berdyaev, in the article, The Religious Foundations of Bolshevism, and also in the article, A Russian Prokremada, Lenin. Both argued that Bolshevism or Leninism was the manifestation of a religious worldview, which distinguished Bolsheviks from Western European Marxists. Thus, Berdyayev and Bonsov were among the first to interpret Bolshevism as a kind of, a, of secular religion. Later, both repeatedly returned to this concept. What is especially important, Berdyayev argued that such a religion of revolutionary socialism could develop only on Russian soil. Uh, I quote, Bolshevism is a Russian a national phenomenon. And this is our national ailment, which also in the past has always existed in Russian history, but in different forms. And, and after the beginning of the Bolshevik revolution, Beredyaev's faith in Russia's special mission suffered a severe blow. In 1918, in an article with an eloquent title, The Death of Russian Illusions, he wrote, I quote, the most opposing Russian ideologies asserted that the Russian people were superior to European civilization, that the law of civilization was not a decree for them, that European civilization was too bourgeois for Russians, that the Russians were called to realize the kingdom of God on earth, the kingdom of supreme truth and justice. This was asserted by the Slavophiles on the right, supporters of Russian religious and national identity, and on the left by the revolutionaries, socialists, and anarchists, who were no less proponents of Eastern original path than the Slavophiles and opposed the revolutionary light from the East to the bourgeois West. This Russian light, which should enlighten all the peoples of the world, has brought Russia to the final humiliation and shame. We have mistaken our backwardness for our advantage, a sign of our higher vocation and our greatness." End of quote. So, uh, Berdyaev was deeply disappointed in Russian messianism in, in that time. In 1919, Donsol went abroad, fleeing from the Bolsheviks. Berdyayev spent the years of the revolution in Soviet Russia, but in 1921, the Bolsheviks expelled him abroad too. In exile, both thinkers constantly addressed the Russian issues, including the topics of Russian communism and messianism. Studying Russian communism as the main enemy of Ukrainian nationalism, Donso was one of the first to formulate some concepts that later became widespread about the connection of communism with the Russian tradition, especially with Russian messianism, about communism as a political religion, about the typological similarity of Bolshevism and fascism, and so on. In his book, The Foundation of Our Policy, published in early 1921, Tonsou described communism not as an international movement to overthrow capitalism, but as a purely Russian phenomenon, an organic product of traditional Russian culture and the last phase of Russia's eternal struggle against the West. In this sense, the Bolsheviks inherited the Tsarist regime, Slavophilism, and even Russian orthodoxy. I quote, some dream of Moscow, the third Rome, others of Moscow, 
the capital of the Third International. The ideologues of Russian Messianism differed in the details of their opinions, but all firmly and steadfastly believed that the Russian people would lead all other peoples towards, albeit unknown, but a great future. End of quote. And this don't show you that the roots of Bolshevism are in traditional Russian spirituality, and in particular in Russian Messianism, resonate with Berdyaev's ideas, most fully articulated in the Origin of Russian Communism, published 16 years later. In this book, the Russian philosopher wrote, I quote, instead of the third Rome in Russia, the third international was achieved, and many of the features of the third Rome pass over to the third international. The fact that the third international is not international, but a Russian national idea is very poorly understood in the West. Here we have the transformation of Russian message. Western communists, when they join the third international, play a humiliating part. They do not understand that in joining the third international, they are joining the Russian people and realizing its messianic vocation. And the messianic consciousness of the working class and proletariat is bringing about an almost love of field attitude toward the West, toward the West. We see that Donso and Berdyaev not only express similar views on the connection between communism and Russian messianism, but also resort to the same metaphor, the third international instead of the third role. Both thinkers also touched on the participation of Jews in Russian communism and again came to similar conclusions. And so wrote, I quote, both Jews and Muscovites are a chosen nation in their own eyes. And when almost all Jewish parties have embraced Bolshevism, exaggeration of course, is it not because the messianic, is it not because the messianic idea lies in the blood of this race? And we find a similar opinion in Berdyaev's book, but without reference to blood. I quote, I am inclined to think that even the active share of the Jews in Russian communism is very characteristic of Russia and the Russian people. Russian messianism is akin to Jewish message. End of quote. So, can we assume the mutual influence of Berdyaev and Donso? Donso did read some of Berdyaev's works and could well borrow his thoughts. Was Berdyaev familiar with Donso's foundations of our policy? It is quite possible Berdyaev found himself in exile in Berlin uh, just when Donso's books was published in Vienna and it was immediately discussed in Ukrainian emigration circles. For Berdyaev, who lived in Kiev for many years, the Ukrainian was, wasn't a foreign language. Let me remind that the philosopher's brother, Sergei Berdyaev, translated and wrote Ukrainian poetry and considered himself a Ukrainian. However, I have no evidence of Gontsov's direct or indirect influence of Berdyaev. It is possible that being connected to a common network of intellectual discourse Donso and Berdyaev independently came to similar conclusions. In the early 1920s, similar ideas were in the air. In July 1921, a few months after the publication of Donso's book, a collection of articles, change of signposts, Smena Vech, appeared in Prague. The authors of which Russian emigrants argued, like Donso, that Bolshevism is a national Russian phenomenon. But unlike them so, they urged emigrants to accept the Bolshevik revolution, to preserve the unity and power of the Russian state. One of the authors of the collection, Yuri Potekin, wrote, I quote, by a fatal irony of fate, or perhaps by the impartial and unmistakable judgment of history, the Russian national cause can now be done not in the collapsed Russia of the Third Rome, but in the Russia of the Third International. 
So it is not known who first compared the Third Rome with the Third International, Bonso or anyone else, but this comparison became, became widespread long before Berdyaev used it. Donso and Berdyaev's view, views on Russian messianism and Russian attitude toward the West had much in common, but they also had many differences. Berdyaev believed that Russians had always had a true messianic consciousness, even if Bolshevik messianism had become a distortion of original Russian messianism. Donso, at the end of this uh, of his life, concluded that the Russian messianic idea was only a mask for Russian imperialism. He wrote about this in the book Spirit of Russia, published in German in 1961. I quote, an idea that is constantly changing, which is actually a mask created on lies, is something more than an idea. It is a naked desire to subdue all around. That is, the idea plays only the role of camouflage to deceive the naive world about the carefully concealed goals behind it." End of quote. Although Berdyaev stressed that the Russian people in their uh, spiritual makeup are an Eastern people, that is fundamentally different from Western peoples. Don so much more than Berdyaev opposed Russia to the West. He defined the chief differences between the West and Russia in that way. I quote, a greater role for the individual and free groups of individuals, a sense of personal dignity of one's own rights and obligations, activity in support of social organization, these are the chief distinguishing marks of Western society. Suppression and passivity of the individual, the absence of a legal mind, the complete absence of autonomous morality replaced here by decrees or the speak, these are the chief features of Russian society. Hence, self-government in the broadest sense in the West, chaos or absolutism in Russia. End of quote. I already mentioned that Donso saw relations between the West and Russia as an eternal struggle. Why is Russia fundamentally hostile to Europe and why must it struggle against Europe? Donso asks, then answers his own question. I quote, the amorphous Russian must can be governed only by absolutism, self-active European society only by self-action. Therefore, Russia must, on the, on the one hand, defend itself against the European principle and keep out European bacilli. For once Russia is infected by them, they can lead only to debauchery and to decomposition of the state mechanism. On the other hand, Russia must strive to destroy this Europe, to destroy its ideas wherever its influence reaches for these ideas are its sole defense against any force, including Moscovite absolutism, that strives for domination over the continent. From this statement, in Donso opinion, follows an important conclusion for Ukrainian policy. I quote, the foundation of the great crisis shaking our continent, the conflict between Europe and Russia, is the deep opposition between hostile civilizations. It is this absolute incompatibility of the two cultures and the inevitability of struggle between them, the struggle under whose sign the entire European crisis develops and will develop, that we must keep in mind when we define the role of Ukraine in this conflict, when we define the lines of our policy, or the essence of our collective ideal. And Donso goes so far as to proclaim the struggle against Russia, the collective ideal or national idea of the Ukrainian nation. This ideal, he wrote, is dictated to us by our historical traditions, our geographical position, 
and the special historical role that we are destined to play. The geographical position of Ukraine has made it into an arena of ceaseless political and cultural struggle between worlds. The Byzantine, Tatar, Moscovite world and the Roman European world. Ukraine has fallen away from the latter politically, but never culturally. And Don so concludes, I quote, unity with Europe under all circumstances and at any price, that is the categorical imperative of our foreign policy. End of quote. In 1921, it may have seemed to do so that a single European path of development existed in confrontation with Bolshevism, which for Donso was merely a cover for Russian anti-Western imperialism. But as early as the next year, 1922, the fascist victory in Italy revealed a so-called third way that rejected both liberal capitalism and Marxist socialism. And after some vacillations, Donso and following him many other Ukrainian nationalists became resolute supporters of this third way. Why? The struggle with Russia in alliance with Europe was, as I said, Donsov's main political idea. However, in the 1920s, Donsov was disappointed in the ability of a democratic Europe to resist Bolshevik Russia. Now he pinned his hopes on fascist Europe. These hopes were especially heightened when Hitler came to power in Germany. These hopes were especially, and, and uh, national socialists did not hide their militant intentions towards Russia and try to play the Ukrainian card against it. This was the first reason. And there was also another reason for Donsov's interest in fascism and national socialism. For Donsov, as well as for Berdyayev, Bolshevism was an, was an example of effective political religion. Donsov saw in it purely religious features, dogmatism, bigotry, intolerance of heresies, the cult of communist science messages. He believed that it was not the intellectualism of reasonable people that could defeat this new religion, but only another, no less fanatical political religion, such as fascism. What can nationalism oppose to Bolshevism? Donsov asks and answers with Hitler's words. The worldview impregnated by hellish intolerance can be broken only by the same spirit adopted, defended by the same will, but in itself poor and true idea. At first glance, in Berdyayev's article, The Clash of Faith and Reason, 19. 38, you find a similar idea. I quote, demonic temptations cannot be opposed with bourgeois rationality and reason, bourgeois negative and formal freedom. The devouring power of demonic fire can only be opposed by fire, by but different, luminous and liberating fire, end of quote. However, for Berdyaev, the bearers of demonic fire were both communism and fascism. If Donso believed that a dictatorship could only be defeated by another dictatorship, then Berdyayev was concerned about the question. I quote, can dictatorship, dictatorships be overthrown by a force that will not itself become, become a dictatorship? Can freedom exercise justice in the world? End of quote. He didn't know the answer, but hoped that freedom could win without a dictatorship. Donso and Berdyayev came to similar conclusions comparing Russian communism with fascism and finding between them numerous parallels. But if Berdyayev categorically didn't accept the totalitarian concept of communism and fascism, contrasting it with the ideas of Christian revival and personalist socialism, Donso concluded that the totalitarian religion of communism could be defeated only by the equally 
totalitarian religion of nationalism. And that in the future conflict, Ukrainians might, must take the side of a new fascist Europe. This idea took over the radical wind of the Ukrainian nationalist movement on the eve of the Second World War. Berdyayev made another choice. Like Gonzo, he wrote about the crisis of European democracies, about their moral decay, as evidenced for him by the Munich Agreement with Hitler. However, for him, in the clash between totalitarian states and between them and democratic states, people of reason must be on the side of democracies. Both Berdyayev and Gonzo believed that Messianism was a defining feature of Russian history and would remain so for the foreseeable future. However, they, uh, they saw Russian, Russia's future differently. Berdyayev, delivered, uh, be, uh, the Berdyayev believed that after overcoming communism, Russia would be able to return to its true mission, to give humanity a truth unknown to the West and ultimately contrib contribute to the synthesis of West and East into a single Christian civilization. Donsov never believed that Russia had any special truth it could give to the world. In 1921, when he still believed in European democracy, he also deeply doubted whether Russian, Russia would ever be able to embark on the path of European progress and democracy. He, recall, he recalled the words of the Russian thinker, Chadai. We have something in the blood that rejects any real progress. Donso left open the question of whether democracy is possible in Russia. He wrote, he wrote one can leave aside the question of future Russia or third Russia, which no one has ever seen in a dream, whether it will ever be able to adopt the principles of European democracy or whether Chadai was right. One thing is for sure, that throughout its millennium history, Russia has seemed incapable of adopting these ideas." End of quote. Today we are in, in a better position than Bonso and Berdyayev. We can see the third, that is post-communist Russia, not in a dream, but reality. So we can assess the correctness of their predictions about the future development of Russia. Russian messianism and Russia's attitudes to the West and Ukraine. It is quite obvious that so far, Donso's predictions are coming true much more than Berdyayev's. We don't see any signs that Russia can offer the West some truth unknown to it and to promote the synthesis of the West and the East. On the contrary, over the past two decades, Russia has become increasingly hostile to the West and Ukraine, which the West has allegedly tried to turn into anti-Russia. Instead of the universal brotherhood in Christ that Berdyayev dreamed of, Russia unleashed a large-scale war in Europe. As for democracy, Bonzo also turned out to be right. Russia is just as incapable of adopting European-style democracy as it was a hundred years ago. Dunsov's skepticism about the possibility of democratization and westernization of Russia coincides with the assessments of present-day Putinists. And we need to understand that Putinists are franker than Putin himself. What Putin has in mind, their followers express in words. For example, Moscow writer Vadim Kirpichov, the author of the book Putin against the liberal swamp, how to save Russia, wrote in 2014, I quote, democracy in Russia is impossible. Not now, not in any future. Either Russia or democracy, either Maluta or Smuta, either Caesar or the Russian revolt. The third is not given. Therefore, in each cycle, Russia is forced to seek salvation in the imperial culture, end of quote. And let me remind that Malutas Kurato was the most odious leader of state terror during the reign of Ivan the Terrible. And Smuta was a time of unrest and anarchy which began in Russia 14 years after his death. 
And I continue to quote Kirpichov. It seems to some that sooner or later, Russia will become the West. This can never be expected. Russia's task is not at all to become the West. This is impossible in principle, but to oppose it by imitating the West with its own separate Eurasian civilization. Russia's way is to improve the imperial form of government, to live as a separate civilization in harmony with its own destiny. As for messianism, it really revived in modern Russia, but not in the form that Berdyaev wanted to see. Post-communist Russia has for some time lost the ideology of global messianism. Later, it began to be revived in a narrow form in the idea of the Russian world, Uski Mir. But recently, Russian messianism, this time dressed in anti-fascist clothes, is regaining global ambitions. In 2014, when Russian aggression against Ukraine began, Vadim Kirpichov wrote, I quote, the struggle against fascism immediately give us back the meaning of existence, end of quote. Ukrainian journalist Boris Bakhtyev then rightly remarked, I quote, today, the rhetoric of the struggle against fascism is increasingly merging with the traditional messianic rhetoric. Russia seems to have finally found what its messianic purpose is. No wonder that many Russians believe today that the Russian army in Ukraine is fighting the fascist and Nazis. Is this messianic anti-fascist rhetoric of the Russian leadership and is propaganda sincere? Definitely not. This is just a must to cover up Russia's imperialist face. Here too, Donsov was right. As we can see, some of Donsov's observations and predictions about Russia are still true. Does this mean that Russia will never change? I don't think so. Contrary to the unanimous opinion of Donsov and Kirpichov, neither Russia nor any other country is doomed to authoritarianism and lack of democracy. And uh, concluding, the comparison of the views of the two thinkers, Operdiaev and Donsov, on Russian communism is of academic interest in a broader context. The study of the intellectual interaction and migration of ideas between different currents of social and political thought which in one way or another try to find a response to the historical challenge of Bolshevism. However, the study of Berdyaev's and Dumsov ideas is not only of academic, but also of practical interest. The diagnosis made by Dumsov and Berdyaev in the 1920s and 1930s are still largely true. This means that what is happening now is not just the result of a crazy decision by one or more people. This is the result of hostility to the West deeply rooted in the mentality of some Russians. It will not be easy to change this mentality. So there is a long struggle ahead of us, Ukrainians, and those Russians who want to change their country. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. And now we will entertain questions, uh, written questions, please. Uh, and uh, I will I will uh, start with uh, um, Frank Sisson's question: Did either Birdiaev or Donsov deal with the Euro-Atlantic West, or specifically with the United States? as part of the West, and how did they place it? Thank you for this question. Both Berdyaev and Donso, when uh, he wrote about the West, meant, first of all, Europe, because uh, Europe for them, and uh, in the history of the, the interwar period, was much more important both for Russia, for Ukraine, for Eastern Europe, then the United States. But when uh, Don Sol, after the Second World War, uh, found himself 
in Canada and visited also United States. He wrote uh, about the United States too, but uh, he was deeply disappointed with uh, Western position uh, towards Soviet Union. And in his uh, last books and articles, he constant, constantly criticized the United States and the West as a whole and the NATO for uh, their weak position towards, uh, towards the Soviet Union and Russia. And he urged the West to, uh, to take a stronger position uh, towards Russia because he never believed in, in detention. He never believed that in a true coexistence between two worlds. And he predicted that in future, the conflict between West and East uh, is uh, unavoidable. So uh, his position toward United, towards United States was very critical. As for Berdyaev, I can't remember that uh, Berdyaev wrote something important about the, uh, about the United States. But I am not an expert in the Berdyaev's philosophy and uh, Berdyaev's political view. I need Berdyaev uh, only for the comparison with my uh, main personage, uh, because I'm writing an intellectual biography of Don So. So I, uh, I, I can mistake about the position of Berdyaev. But it is clear for me that Don So, in, at the end of his, in the last decade of his life, uh, have, has uh, had very critical position towards uh, United States and its politics towards Soviet Union. All right. And now we have two questions from George Shaw. Uh, the first question is How would Biryayev and Don So? define modernization? And the second question from the same person, do Donsov and Birdyaev have intellectual opponents in Russia, Ukraine, or wider Slavic nations? How popular are their ideas? Uh, so how did So and Birdyaev define modernization? Uh, in his early years as a uh, ideologue of uh, Ukrainian integral nationalism, Donsov seemed to be a supporter of modernization. And uh, he wrote several articles in which he wrote, for example, that Ukrainians must conquer cities because uh, the real progress in, in the cities. He wrote articles uh, in which he uh, support modernization. Uh, for for uh, Berdyaev, modernization uh, was first of all technical modernization, and also or maybe organizational modernization. But uh, starting from 1930s, uh, Donsov became uh, an enemy of modernization. He turned to the uh, so-called conservative revolution, and uh, he even. Uh, called for returning to Middle Ages. And maybe even the article, uh, the book by uh, Berdyaev, The New Middle Ages, uh, had an influence for it. So for uh, Don Sov in the uh, second half of, uh, of his life, um, the modernization was something bad. And he rather uh, called for, uh, to return to the uh, such times as Kievan Rus and uh, Kozak era in Ukrainian history, uh, which he considered as a golden age of uh, Ukraine, where the Ukraine was strong, where, uh, where Ukraine wa was inhabited but a strong people and uh, when uh, Ukraine has a uh, true elite. Uh, for Berdyaev, Berdyaev uh, was, it seems to me that uh, he was skeptical toward modernization. Uh, he considered modernization as a, as a Western uh, invention, 
as a feature of Western password development. And he thought that the Western modernization and Western password development as a whole must be uh, replenished, must be completed with the special spiritual truth which only Russia has. And I uh, repeat that the main uh, dream of Berdyaev was uh, that in future Russian truth must, uh, Russia must give his truth to the West and uh, support the synthesis of the West, so-called Western truth, uh, uh, with its modernization progress and its part with the Eastern truth, spiritual truth of Russia and Eastern orthodoxy. Thank and, you for, for this. And now, this and now uh, the second question of the same person, mm -hmm. uh, do Donsov and Birdyaev have intellectual opponents in Russia, Ukraine, or wider Slavic nations? And how popular are their ideas? Yes, both of them have intellectual opponents in Russia, in Ukraine, in, uh, or wider uh, Slavic nation. As for Berdyaev, uh, not all the Russians believed in a, a special mission of uh, Russia. Uh, and Berdyaev, uh, for example, uh, had its opponents in, the, in Bolsheviks, because for Bolsheviks, uh, uh, Berdyaev, even if, uh, even if he recognized that, that the communist was partially, uh, partially right, for Bolsheviks, uh, Berdyaev always was an enemy. And uh, maybe I even uh, now uh, try to uh, find a quotation from Berdyaev, what uh, he wrote about Russian communism. Uh, it is from Russian idea. Russian communism is a distortion of the Russian messianic idea. It proclaims light from the East, which is destined to enlighten the bourgeois darkness of the West. There is, uh, there is in communism its own truth and its own falsehood. Its truth is a social truth, a revelation of the possibility of the brotherhood of man and all peoples, the suppression of classes, whereas its falsehood lies in its spiritual foundation, which result in a process of dehumanization, in the denial of the worth of the individual, individual man, in the narrowing of human thought, a thing which had already existed in Russian nihilism. Communism is a Russian phenomenon in spite of its Marxist ideology. Communism is the Russian destiny. It is a moment in the inner destiny of the Russian people, and it must be lived through, the, uh, through by the inward trends of the Russian people. Communism must be surmounted, but not destroyed. And into the highest stage, which will come after communism, there must enter the truth of communism also, but freed from its element of falsehood. So in spite of uh, this recognition of partial truth of communism. Of course, for uh, Soviet communists, uh, Berdyaev was an enemy. It was a bourgeois, a bourgeois falsifier of Russian communism because, uh, of course, Russian communists doesn't recognize that, uh, that there is a process of de dehumanization in Soviet Union. So uh, he was enemies, uh, open enemies in, uh, in Russian communists, but also some democratic and liberal thinkers in immigration uh, disagreed with uh, this uh, Berdyaev in uh, this theory of eternal uh, Russian messianism from the uh, at least 16th century to the uh, contemporary times. As for Donsov, he was even worse enemy of communism and, uh, 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 than Berdyaev. But also, Donso had uh, have intellectual opponents in uh, other currents of Ukrainian political thought, in liberal currents, uh, for example, in Ukrainian National Democratic uh, Organization, which existed in Intervoy Ukraine, 
in democratic social currents and vast uh, one of the most important uh, of the intellectual opponents and critics of Donsov's, especially of Donsov's pro-fascist ideas was uh, Ukrainian social socialist radical Karlo Kobersky, who wrote and uh, as a pseudonym uh, Pushkar. I think it is it is very important uh, figure in the Ukrainian political thought of the 1920s and 1930s, but unfortunately almost f- forget it now. And I think that uh, such figures as uh, Karlo Kobersky, as uh, other critics of U- uh, Ukrainian integral nationalism, uh, uh, and uh, in particular Donsov's active nationalist uh, deserve more attention from, from historians. And how popular uh, are their ideas? Of course, uh, Berdyaev's ideas were much more popular, in particular in the West, than Donsov's ideas, because uh, beyond the circles of Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian emigration, Donsov was little. Uh, Berdyaev uh, had a huge influence, especially on Western so-called Sovietology. And uh, till now, Berdyaev uh, had a uh, important influence of the philosophical and even political thought in the West and after 1991 also in Russia. So uh, Berdyaev, of course, is much more popular than uh, than Donsov. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, since there are no written questions here, I would like to ask my question, or actually question concerning two individuals. I would like to ask you about historical education of Putin. Uh, does Putin have um, his own uh, vision of history, or is everything he writes basically uh, written by his uh, assistants, helpers, um, ideologists. So how about Putin's um, historical views? I assume uh, Putin has never read Birdyaev, but uh, maybe. So this is my first question about historical education of, of Putin. And the second question is about someone, someone um, else. I belong to a generation which uh, uh, once worshipped Solzhenitsyn. We were so impressed with Solzhenitsyn's writing and, uh, well, you know what I'm talking about. And then we saw another face of Solzhenitsyn, which was less attractive to us. Did Solzhenitsyn have any opinion about Birdyaev? Mm-hmm. As for your first question, of course, I don't know exactly uh, whether Putin wrote uh, their articles and speeches himself, but I suppose that, uh, no, I suppose that all these articles are written by uh, Putin, uh, historians who are Putinists. And uh, Anyway, these ideas are stupid. And uh, because, uh, partly because of these ideas, Putin's underestimation of Ukrainians was not a surprise to me, as I read some of his articles and speeches, as well as statements from people around him. It seems that he inadequately assesses uh, reality. I think it's because Putin, like other dictators, has surrounded himself with people who tell him what he wants to hear and are afraid to say things that may upset him. He believed that most Ukrainians considered themselves to be one people with Russians, wanted an alliance with Russia and hated the nationalist government and therefore would not resist the invasion. And his advisors in, uh, incited him and supported his illusions. Therefore, Putin expected that only a handful of nationals would resist, but he uh, miscalculated. 
Uh, and in addition, for too long, he did not meet a decisive rebuff to his aggressive actions. In uh, 2008, the Russian troops quite easily defeated the Georgian army. In uh, 2014, Putin captured Crimea almost without a single shot. And then Russian troops defeated poorly armed and in, in experienced Ukrainian battalions, uh, volunteers battalions in the Donbass. But Putin underestimated the fact that in eight years, Ukraine has created an efficient army, emerged from the crisis and became much more cohesive. So uh, either Putin himself was the author of uh, all these articles and speeches or uh, uh, they was written for him by his uh, speechwriters and some historian. He miscalculated, and uh, this was a catastrophe for Putin, I think. And your, uh, about your second question, uh, you see, I, I don't know Solzhenitsyn very well, and I can't remember if Solzhenitsyn referred to uh, Berdyaev's views. But like Berdyaev, Solzhenitsyn also believed uh, in the special truth which exists in uh, Russian East, in Russian Orthodoxy. And uh, like Berdyaev, he believed that Russia must give this truth to the world. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, Maybe when uh, Russia became a democratic state, and I, uh, I believe that it is possible, but not now, it is possible in future. Russia would be able to give some of his truth to the West, but uh, I never believed in uh, that uh, this so-called truth of Russia is something more important that uh, the truth of Western civilization. That is my answer. Thank you for your question. So, so, so you don't really uh, remember about any connections between Birdiaev and Solzhenitsyn? Unfortunately, unfortunately not, because I uh, read some uh, novels by uh, Solzhenitsyn, and I uh, remember that I read his uh, article, Kak nam obustroit how to say it in English, how we can rebuild Russia, something like this. But I can't remember the references to Berdyaev in uh, this article, because simply because I know Solzhenitsyn not uh, so good. Well, uh, all right. Um, any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Any, any, any questions? I understand this is a pretty sophisticated top topic and not everybody uh, studied Bidia for Don Sof, but uh, um, we are uh, open, we are ready to entertain your questions. Go ahead if you, if you, if you want. Maybe I, I add some words because uh, I have uh, three people here in this room and uh, they uh, skeptically reacted uh, to my uh, suggestion that uh, Russia will uh, can change in the future. I want to quote Kirpichov, uh, Putin is Kirpichov again. Uh, he wrote, the competent destruction of Russia must be carried out with the help of the liberals. It is against the liberal ideology that the Russian Federation is the least protected. Against the background of a liberal democratic West, authoritarian capitalist Russia looks archaic, historically doomed. And for me, what this staunch anti-liberal fighter sees as a, a Russia's destruction would actually be salvation both for Russia and for Ukraine. And to paraphrase Kirpichov, the competent destruction of authoritarianism, anti-Westernism and imperialism in Russia must be carried out with the help of Russian liberals and Democrats. And I believe if Putin's Russia is clearly our enemy, 
then oppositional democratic Russia must become our ally. I know that this is not the most popular historian of Russia um, in, in certain academic circles, but personally, I admire Richard Pipes. Uh, I, I believe that his contribution to history of Russia is, is, is very important. And as you know, Richard Pipes claimed that this is not true that Russian past and Russian character is homogeneously authoritarian and there was only authoritarian tradition in Russian history. And Pipes says, look at Novgorod. Novgorod was organized and ruled in a completely different, different way. Uh, what, how would you answer this, uh, this argument? Uh, partially, I agree, because Novgorod was a possible alternative for the Moscow way of uh, development. But we know that Novgorod was captured by uh, Moscovite uh, princedom and completely distracted. So this alternative was not realized. But there was uh, other examples of the possibilities of democratic development over Russia. Uh, I mean the uh, democratic trends in uh, Russia, uh, ra uh, Russian politics in 19th century. I mean uh, the several months after the February revolution, when it was seen that Russia uh, chose a democratic way of uh, development, but Bolshevik destructed uh, it. And finally, I mean uh, several years at the end of Gorbachev's perestroika and first years of the existence of uh, independent Russian Federation, when also Russia seemed to, be, to choose a democratic way of development. But uh, even earlier that uh, Putin came to power, Russia uh, started to turn uh, into an authoritarian way. And when Putin rise to power, this uh, democratic choice was distracted, uh, distracted finally. And from uh, the early 2000 years, Russia clearly, clearly developed uh, into authoritarian and even totalitarian, semi-fascist and maybe not, uh, even uh, neo-fascist state. So these examples of democratic uh, development, of fragments of de democratic development for Russia in the past give us hope, but I don't. But I, I, I'm not sure that this hope will be uh, realized in the future. I hope so, because uh, be, it would be salvation not for, only for Russia, but for us as a neighbors of Russia. Yeah, obviously it's difficult to foresee anything. Um, there is another question here from Susan, Susan Singh, and the question is, is there a link between the Orthodox Church and the Messianic views of the philo philosophers? The of course it is, of course it is, because all the uh, Messianic views of Berdyaev, uh, and Berdyaev was not, uh, wasn't only a dispassionate scholar of Russian message. He was a, a passionate proponent of Russian message. And this uh, Berdyaev's message, his uh, belief, uh, his faith in the uh, Russian special mission was uh, completely built on the uh, Eastern Orthodoxy as Berdyaev uh, understand, understood it. Of course, this uh, Berdyaev's view on the uh, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy never uh, coincided with the official, official Orthodox faith in Russia, with the position of the official Orthodox Church, uh, church in Russia. But of course, uh, Berdyaev was an Orthodox and uh, this Eastern Orthodoxy had a great influence of the Berdyaev's philosophy and especially on, on, its, on, on his uh, face in a uh, special Russian mission and uh, Russian message. 
How about Don Tso? No, Don Tso was, uh, when Don Tso wrote his book, uh, Foundation of Our Policy, he was an atheist. And uh, politically, uh, he was an enemy of Russian Orthodox Church. He even uh, believed that Union Church, Greek Catholic Church, would be a best choice for Ukraine. And he remained an atheist even in uh, next years. He uh, wrote much about the church. He uh, recognized the uh, significance of the church for the uh, national interest. But in private letters, he uh, wrote uh, somewhat... Uh, He wrote to uh, one of the Ukrainian nationalists, Yevhen Onatsky, that he is atheist clerical. That is clerical or clerical atheist, uh, like, uh, for example, Charles Moras. So many integral nationalists consider the church very important for nation, for national interest, but remained, if not atheist, uh, so uh, there was agnostics, at least. In the uh, last period of his life, Don So became a religious man and even religious mystics. But uh, Orthodox Church, Orthodox Church, uh, or, or uh, neither Russian Orthodox Church uh, it, uh, or uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church, never, never had an important influence for uh, his views. He was a nationalist and in integral nationalist was a kind of religion for him. So he needed no other religion. We still have some time. So, uh, and uh, Professor Sisson is back with a question and I'm reading the question. Could one not argue that Ukrainians were crucial to Russian liberalism. Uh, Drahomonov, um, uh, Kistyakovsky, and that removal from Ukraine, uh, f and that uh, removal from, removal, I guess, Ukrainians from the Russian world, therefore weakens these tendencies. Hmm, it's a very interesting idea. I. Um... Never thought about, about this, but I prone to agree with Francis. And yes, uh, the removal of Ukrainian liberals and uh, Democrats from uh, this all Russian uh, liberal world weakened uh, these tendencies in Russia. And maybe it is one of the causes why liberals, uh, liberalism till our days is so weak in Russia. So it is very interesting uh, explanation. All right. Um, any questions, please? Good. If there are no more questions, we will close our session. Uh, I would like to, to uh, thank uh, Olga Kesarchuk and Larissa Yarovenko for their help. And first of all, uh, many thanks to you, Professor Zaitsev. Uh, and I hope we will see you uh, back in Toronto sometime in the future. Thank you. Thank you, you Professor. Thank, thank you very much to you. Thank, to you. thank you again. To the center and to the YASIC program for this opportunity. Great. Thanks a lot and goodbye. Goodbye.